coverage of global business. And today we will provide a comprehensive overview of China's economy for the entire year of 2023, focusing on three aspects. Steady recovery, ongoing opening up, and the promising outlook for the coming year. My colleagues will join me in the studio to share with us their valuable insights, and we also have invited professional guests to share with us their perspectives on China's macroeconomy and offer predictions for the upcoming year. First, let's retrace the key developments and stories that have shaped the economic landscape in 2023. Our reporter Xu Yi has more. 2023 is a crucial year for recovery from the pandemic and for the economic order to return. A challenging year, people said. But China has really shown its strength by pushing through external pressures and overcoming internal obstacles. It's like China has taken a wavy curve and turned it into a success story for economic recovery. To 4.6, so we see growth in China this year at 5.4, next year at 4.6, and you know if you do the math, that means that this year China is going to account for around one third of global growth. This year, China has achieved advanced growth globally, stable employment, and a balanced internal payment situation. It's like they weathered the storm of the pandemic and stabilized the trade market, coming out even stronger. But that's not all. There are really some other exciting moments too. Scientific and tech innovation has opened up new opportunities, with major projects showcasing breakthroughs in key areas and the continuous optimization of the industrial structure. The transformation has been quite dramatic, with the automobile industry chain surpassing 10 trillion yuan GDP and high-end strategic emerging industries such as new energy, semiconductors, consumer electronics, and communications exceeding 15 trillion yuan. And let's not forget about the surge in consumption driving internal demand across the country. With encouraging policies in place, China's retail growth is expected to rise by 5% in 2023. People are planning to spend more on tourism and digital services, and luxury purchases are on the rise too. Looking ahead, China still faces challenges in stimulating internal demand and dealing with global uncertainties. The Central Economic Work Conference has laid out the plan for 2024 economic work, emphasizing progress while ensuring stability and establishing the new before abolishing the old. Despite the challenges, the fundamental trend of economic recovery and the long-term positive outlook remain unchanged. It's like China is gearing up for another round of impressive economic resilience. Well, China's economic recovery is supported by government policies outlined in the Central Economic Work Conference, emphasizing progress with stability and active advancement, along with prudent monetary policies and proactive fiscal measures. Furthermore, the Central Financial Work Conference emphasizes the need for enhanced financial supervision, optimized financial services, and risk prevention to facilitate the high-quality development of China's financial sector. Additionally, efforts to enhance financial services for private companies have been initiated by eight state agencies led by the People's Bank of China to further stimulate economic growth. Since the second quarter, numerous international organizations and foreign institutions have raised their expectations for China's economic growth. The United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs spearheaded this trend by increasing China's economic growth expectations from 4.8% to 5.3%. Following China's faster-than-expected economic growth in the third quarter, the International Monetary Fund and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development adjusted their growth expectations to 5.4% and 5.2% respectively. Foreign institutions have similarly adjusted their forecasts, with J.P. Morgan Chase raising its forecast to 5.2% and Morgan Stanley to 5.1%, Citigroup and UBS to 5.3% and 5.2% respectively. Time now for me to head over to my colleague Wang Tianyu in the studio. Tianyu, it's been a very eventful year, very exciting year of 2023. You had been traveling all across the country. I wonder, what is your first-hand impression about economic recovery in China? Well, Lily, uh, can you remember how many times that we and our colleagues travel for business in 2023? Too many to record. <laughs> very frequent, right? Yeah. So if you compare this with the 2022, you get the answer. Because this year is the first year that China released its COVID restrictions. No travel barrier. 
and no mask needed, no health code requirement, so people can freely uh, go out and move. So it is obvious that the economy will be more would be more vibrant uh, if you know there's n the people's mobility is going up. So in you know after right after China released uh, its COVID restrictions at the end of 2022. And I went to the city of Wuhan in central China, which was the first city get hit by the COVID. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see like, uh, how the city was like after everything was changed. And you know, I still remember at the last day of 2022, the New Year's Eve, me and my cameraman went out on the street and you know, celebrating the New Year's Eve with uh, the crowd. And you know, the vehicle roads turned to the walking streets. And uh, I don't know if you can see that in the picture. And there's so many people. You barely, you can't see the end of the people. And uh, you know, uh, you know, it, everyone is so exciting because people waiting for this moment for so long. And I think most of the people there uh, have the same mindset as I did. Is we just want to have the big party. We just want to have fun with our family and friends because. A lot of things was restrained in the past three years, and that was the first time that I saw so many people after the COVID was broke out. And I also want to mention about the, the catering sector, because mm. you know, catering sector is one of the most seriously hit uh, industry during the COVID, but it also have the capability to you know to restore or to recover in a short span of time, because you know, who who don't want to eat? Right. And you know. It, when I was reporting in Wuhan and every restaurant was so full and people have to wait like uh, for hours to just get a single table. But every one of them told me that it's all worth it because, you know, uh, uh, we couldn't wait for this moment, you know, and uh, one of them told me uh, that this catering recovery is like a sign of the overall economic recovery. Mm, that is interesting. I mean, the fun of being able to dine out with friends and families is irreplaceable, right? Mm. And also remember, Tianyu, during year 2023, there had been so many expos, exhibition events. How many of them did you go? I can't remember because <laughs> indeed I've been to so many exhibition events. And, you know, according to the data from the uh, Ministry of Commerce, there were like over 3,200 uh, expos from January to uh, September. And I did my math, and averagely, like 12 expos were being held uh, per day since January to September in this country. So I personally attended the Hainan Expo and uh, the Shanghai Auto Show, and then the China South Asia Expo in Yunnan, Digital Trade Expo in Hangzhou, and then the most significant CIIE, which was focusing on the import uh, products, which also might be the most important exhibition events annually for China. And you know, in this year's CIIE, we saw Australia's Prime Minister, we saw Serbia's Prime Minister, and we saw so many other government officials and global companies seized with. So you see like the, the global companies voted mm -hmm. by their feet. Right. Uh, they they want to be involved is because they see the, the huge potential and the recovering process yes. of China's yes, economy. Yes, of, of course. Yeah, I mean, that was very, all very interesting and very a great insight. I'm sure you enjoyed the year 2023. We're going to have get more workload for you in 2024. Enjoy that year. Thank you so much, Tianyu. Thank you. Thank you. That was my colleague Wang Tianyu with us, sharing with us his insights, traveling and doing interviews across China in the past year. Well, certainly China's consumption has has demonstrated a notable V-shaped recovery as evidenced by the latest retail sales data, which reflects a 7.2% surge compared to the same period in the previous year, that is from January to November. And additionally, the nation has observed pockets of robust activity in manufacturing investment and foreign trade. Our reporters have been actively documenting these developments throughout the year, covering diverse events such as the Canton Fair. Take a look. Kebab, roast fish. It's a paradise for meat lovers. There are so many people here. You can see it's like traffic jams. I don't know if you can hear my voice. It is still 40 minutes until the game begins, but there's barely no empty seat in the stadium. The show's bubbling back. 
one here, one there. It's really exciting, so exciting for the theater industry to get back on its feet. If you walk the city streets, you'll come across numerous internet celebrities capturing moments through photos and live streaming. The emergence of new media has allowed young people to explore alternative career paths, like this blogger. It's obvious that hustle and bustle is a return. Where are you come from? From Bosnia. Colombia. From Algeria. India. Libya. Lebanon. This is the crowd at the 2023 Spring Canton Fair. In a single day, almost half a million people visited. At least 60,000 of them were from overseas. Well, this is Global Business on CGTN. And still to come on the program, we take a look at in 2023, China implemented a series of policies to showcase its commitment to opening up, which attracted numerous foreign investors. Next, we will be delve into the economic outlook for China in 2024, building on those developments. Stay tuned. <laughs> I think we know that this is one of the largest drivers of global growth around the world. Um, there's a huge amount of potential in the Chinese economy. Through that PwC CEO survey that China was one of the brighter spots in the survey, not per se from its perspective of its view on the global economy, but rather its view on the domestic economy. The world will have to get used to China being a very significant part of any portfolio. 18% of the global GDP is, is, is China. And, and, and investors need to have that as part of their diversification portfolio. It's when people ask me what China consumption recovery in 2023 is cautiously optimistic. We are already the best partner, the most important partner uh, on each side of, the, of this dialogue. I'm very optimistic about the Chinese economy. There certainly have been, you know, challenges. There's there's some restructurings and so forth that, that goes on, but the underlying drivers are very strong. Throughout year 2023, China has been actively pursuing extensive reforms and bolstering its commitment to opening up. The nation has introduced a range of policies aimed at reducing barriers for foreign investments, hosted forums and events to attract global talent and consolidate resources, engaged in international dialogues and addressed global concerns by advocating for equ equitable sharing of the gains achieved through high quality development. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Zhu Zhu, who had been so many, made so many interview trips throughout the year, both in and outside China. What are some of the uh, events that impressed you the most? Thank you, Lily, for having me. Yes, I've traveled to some uh, Belt and Road partner countries this year, including like Ethiopia, Malaysia, and Kazakhstan. And a girl from Ethiopia really impressed me. So her name is Sarah, if you can take a look at uh, her picture. So she works in a uh, industrial park named Adama Industrial Park in Ethiopia, and in Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia. So she said that when she came to the company in 2018, hundreds of local people were waiting in very long queues to apply apply for the job because at that time many locals may found it hard to find a job there and those uh, job opportunities provided by those Chinese companies can offer a monthly payment of about uh, 400 yuan or 55 US dollars which is about one third higher than other average market wage so it is uh, quite a, po a, a, a popular job position there at that time and Sarah was a very lucky one she was sent to China to have a uh, half year training um, to do like some training on how to make garments and uh, also on business management. She's now already a senior manager. So cooperation uh, models like this uh, is really helping local people. Um, like uh, for this Adama Industrial Park, it has recruited about 8,000 um, local employees and they also plan to expand the workforce to around 22,000 in the next three years. And after coming back from Ethiopia, I also uh, took part in a um, Belt and Road Forum held in Beijing because this year marks the 10th 
10th anniversary of the establishment of the Belt and Road Agreement. Right. So I will talk to uh, many foreign guests in those Belt and Road partner countries about their views on the BRI cooperation. And they said that in the past 10 years, um, they have expanded many projects that are really benefiting those BRI partner countries. And apart from those uh, traditional ones, such as the infrastructure and agriculture, they also hope to expand more in the emerging sectors, like the services sector, uh, the Green Silk Road, the Digital Silk Road, et cetera. So um, uh, looking ahead in 2024, uh, you can see that many projects in those uh, new sectors have already been signed at the forum. So I'm just very looking forward to see uh, more cooperation in the new um, emerging sectors that can benefit more Belt and Road partner countries mm -hmm. to achieve a shared prosperous future. Other than the Belt and Road Forum, Juju, I know that you also went to the U.S. for the APEC meetings. Yes. What are some of the highlights for you? Yes, um, I, I was very honored to get the opportunity to do reports there. And uh, uh, if you can look, uh, take a look at this picture, if you can see, uh, that is actually um, Sam Oatman, the founder of OpenAI. Uh, it's a very messy but interesting one because um, we just took a very quick and short interview after his, uh, one of his public speakings there. And many of the media people just um, took out their phones and I just immediately took out mine. And <laughs> everyone is looking in a different direction, but you can see that People from different races, different countries are coming together um, to focus on um, those uh, economic issues. And I asked him about his views on artificial intelligence regulation. And he said that there may be a global governance sort of inspired by the International Atomic Energy Agency or something global. Mm -hmm. And he called for more international cooperation on regulating the development of AI. And inspired by his view, I also talked to some other guests at the forum, such as um, Kevin Ellie the uh, co-chair of Apex CEO Summit and also several other um, high-tech um, founders there. They also echoed the same principle and called for more international cooperation, especially between China and the U.S., um, two of the largest uh, AI tech powers in the world with a large amount of data and advanced technologies. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. see that um, uh, platforms like APAD have really provided many opportunities for people from different countries, yeah. those scholars, yeah, industry insiders, to focus on topics that can not only benefit people in the Asia-Pacific region, but also to drive the global economic recovery. Yes, topics of common interest. That yes. is. Thank you very much, Shudu, for sharing Thank with you. us those uh, in highlights from your interview trips. Well, indeed, China and Africa cooperation is one of the highlights of the countries opening up. The deepening trade relations between developing countries through dialogues like South-South cooperation has propelled the mutual development in 2023. And for further insights, let's turn to CTTN's Robert Nagila. Official data shows that in the first seven months of this year, trade between China and Africa grew steadily. Trade between the two was up 7.4% year on year. That's about 1.14 trillion yuan, about 158 billion US dollars. Between January and July, China's exports to Africa grew 20% year on year to about 709 trillion yuan, while imports reached 426 billion yuan. Over the last decade, China has been Africa's largest trading partner, with bilateral trade totaling 1.87 trillion yuan in 2022, up 14.8% year on year. Several events this year highlighted the strong diplomatic and trade ties between China and Africa. The year started with a visit to Africa by China's foreign minister, a three-decade-old tradition that sees Chinese foreign ministers visit Africa in their first overseas trip of the year. In June this year, Changsha in Hunan province hosted the China-Africa Economic Trade Expo. There, deals worth 10.3 billion US dollars were signed. And in August, President Xi Jinping attended the 15th BRIC summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. Two African countries, Egypt and Ethiopia, were among six countries admitted to the bloc. And on the sidelines of the summit, President Xi co-hosted the China-Africa Leaders Dialogue with President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa. Discussions centered on the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Bobat Nagela, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya.
Let's get some insights on China's economic performance in 2023, and we're joined by Mr. Zhu Haibing, Chief China Economist at J.P. Morgan. Mr. Zhu, great to have you on the show, as always. Now, let's start with this. How do you think has the global economy been impacting on, on China's economic performance in year 2023? Yeah, for 2023, uh, global economy, uh, the three key words are uh, inflation, rate hike, and growth. So compared to the forecast one year ago, uh, global inflation did come down, but core CPI still uh, increased more than expected. Uh, this led to the larger than expected rate hike uh, across the board. And despite financial condition tightening, global economy uh, has grown actually more resilient than expected, particularly in the U.S. And also the emerging markets uh, economy shows notable resilience to the external shock. Uh, for China, China's economic cycle is not synchronized with the rest of the world. Uh, post, -reopening, post reopening recovery is a major theme for China in 2023, along with continued efforts to promote structural transformation and high quality growth. In 2023, China's consumption contributes 80% to GDP growth, and within investment, uh, manufacturing and infrastructure provide a lift. Uh, but real estate investment continues to drag on economic growth. Now, the global economic uh, affects China mainly through the trade channels. Uh, according to the IMF, uh, global trade volume only grew less than 1% in 2023, down from 5% in 2022. So accordingly, uh, China's export also decelerated, uh, and, and uh, although China's global export share remains stable. Uh, from growth perspective, contribution from net exports turned from positive to negative. So from that perspective, uh, China's economic performance mainly driven by domestic factors. And so far, Chinese economy is on track to achieve the 5% growth target. Now, uh, many people are looking at China-U.S. you know, economic relations as a sign of where the global economy will be going. Uh, if we look at the so-called tech war between the two countries, it is showing no signs of easing for now, uh, but rather it has expanded from b chips to some other sectors like EV batteries. How do you think will geopolitics be you know, impacting industry dynamics and also affecting business sentiment? Yeah, the U.S.-China tech war is part of the strategic competition between the two largest economies in the world. And I'll say it's uh, in the foreseeable future, the direction is uh, unlikely to change. Uh, so this is actually a taken external condition. Uh, also in recent years, uh, global supply chain uh, in location has seen a shift in focus from efficiency to resiliency a based consideration. So the changing external environment uh, is uh, a challenge for China. And part of the reason why China has been promoting on the innovation and self-sufficiency of the key technology on the domestic front. Although that doesn't mean actually China will change its opening policy. China will continue to promote globalization and opening up policy. Now, having said that, uh, the promoting technology innovation and industry upgrade has been a priority task for China and for, own, uh, for, for the reason of China's own sake. Uh, remember, China is at a critical stage to develop from a middle income to high income economy. Uh, productivity growth is uh, uh, and also climbing up in the global value added chain are important elements in this process. And out of four years of the reform and uh, four decades of reform and opening up policy, Chinese company has become much more competitive. And in some areas, learning by opening up is no longer an option. Uh, and we also uh, should remember that China has a major advantage to achieve this objective, uh, such as the massive domestic market, large supply of the talented engineers and also comprehensive manufacturing sectors. Uh, so I think that uh, the, uh, the, the tech war is, uh, is a challenge, but also it promote, provides opportunity mm -hmm. for China to uh, break through in its own technology and innovations. Mm, point made. And also we know that China's Central Economic Work Conference has laid out priorities for economic work in the upcoming year. How do you think can policy making strike a balance between progress and stability? And what are some of the key takeaways for businesses in this regard? Yes, yeah, the Central Economic Working Conference emphasized that uh, the principle for 2024 economic work is to uh, seek progress while maintaining stability and to promote high quality growth. They lay out nine key uh, tasks uh, in 2024. One key takeaway is that uh, the annual growth target uh, more likely will stay unchanged at around 5%. Uh, to send a signal that uh, the high quality growth does not mean actually growth rate is not important uh, to boost or to uh, improve market confidence. Uh, meanwhile, that uh, the Central Economic Working Conference also 
reflect the Chinese wisdom, uh, finding a balance between different objectives, uh, for example, between supply and demand, uh, between establishing new sectors and breaking old sectors, uh, between opening up and self-sufficiency in key technology. So these are important considerations. But in practice, I think from business perspective, it's important to identify near-term priorities. Uh, from our perspective, for example, measures should be taken to boost domestic demand to address the deflation pressure. Measures should also be taken to mitigate the housing market drag on economic growth, uh, such as public housing and urban village developments mentioned in the meeting. And also that it's important to encourage innovations, not only in the manufacturing, but also in the service sector to join push for technology productivity growth in China. Uh, Mr. Zhu, we're running over time a little bit, but I still wanted to get your outlook for year 2024 for China's e economic performance. Just briefly, please. Yeah, so our 2024 growth forecast is 4.9%, which is in line with our interpretation on the growth target. And we, we want to emphasize a few important changes we expect in 2024. Number one, we believe that fiscal policy and the monetary policy will better coordinate each other uh, to support economic growth. Uh, so the second thing is that we believe the pattern of economic growth likely will return, return to normal uh, in 2024, uh, particularly in pre-pandemic years, consumption typically contributes uh, two-thirds uh, investment on third to economic growth. Uh, so such a pattern has been deviating in recent years and mm -hmm. we believe that 24 might see back to normal. And third one, we believe that the structural transformation will continue, but the divergent performance across different sectors might be less significant mm -hmm. in that uh, the balance between the different sectors will. All right, thank you so much for your insights, great insights. That's Mr. Zhu Haibin, Chief China Economist at JP Morgan for us. Looking ahead, it is crucial to consider the key drivers that will fuel China's economic growth in the coming year, as well as the areas where the government is expected to implement additional support policies. Let's explore the insights and prospects provided by economists on this matter. Growth in 2024 could improve by nominal terms to around 4.7%, that by resilient consumption and continued policy support. I do think with the right policy support, uh, the Chinese market can continue to create potential gain for investors. I expect 2024 to be a better year than 2023. Uh, there will be more government-backed stimulus and more projects taking place. Overall, I expect the business sentiment and consumer sentiment to improve from the low base this year. Uh, on the external demand front, we do see a bit of a recovery in exports uh, for next year. We do think that the government will utilize in monetary policy and more significantly fiscal policy to help uh, support uh, more stable growth next year. There will be two uh, major uh, uh, growth drivers for 2024. First will be uh, making reduce of policy limits and second will be uh, uh, a synergy between consumption and, and investment. But there will be better co collaborations and strong synergy across different policies. I'm just hoping that you know going forward you know, more and more people will see property as part of the uh, sort of a part of the necessary the, the, the consumer the discretionary sector uh, that is helping you know consumption while you know the investment that used to be set aside invested in the property sector you know, will be being used to uh, uh, develop the high-tech uh, sector uh, and the manufacturing sector uh, of the Chinese economy. The dynamism and the competitiveness uh, uh, of the Chinese economy, those things haven't changed and that I think will put it in good stead going forward. China has achieved significant milestones in scientific and technological innovation across various domains, while also actively promoting international cooperation. Up next on Global Business, we'll delve into the technological outlook for 2024. Stay tuned. The Belt and Road Initiative was put forward. It was a very, very good idea and it's the most important development initiative in the world. China is up and again for business. That message uh, came across very strongly. Our exports and services to a market like China are, are critical, very important. 
UAE as a remarkable platform for international trade and the global cooperation. It's a great platform for us to obtain feedback from stakeholders, from consumers, to continue learning. The, uh, the connection with, uh, uh, with China is, um, yeah, is, 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 is famous. Well, you try to enhance uh, cooperation as much as possible. In 2023, the world witnessed the widespread adoption of artificial intelligence systems, sparking substantial discussions among many countries about the future of AI. And my colleague Yang Chenxi is now standing by to share with us his insights on AI and other noteworthy technological advancements in 2023. Take it away, Chenxi. Of course, Lily. Now, in this segment, we're going to look at innovations in consumer technologies that push the envelope in 2023. We should start, of course, with the explosive popularity of generative AI tools popularized by the American chatbot ChatGPT with its amazing ability to hold human-like conversations and solve complex problems. But of course, generative AI is not only text-based. Services like Midjourney allow users to generate images based on human speech prompts. Now, for example, I asked it to gener a generative picture of me as a firefighter, a doctor, and a boxer. Lily, do you think they're realistic? What do you think? Wow, uh, definitely you would be uh, a good boxer, I think. <laughs> Topless. I, well, well, <laughs> Show some muscles there, well, Jason. Thank you. I did ask it to make me look a little bit more handsome than, uh, than in real life. Um, but, well. I'm, I'm sure you look more handsome than those artificial. They need to make some improvements there as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you for that compliment. <laughs> they look very cinematic, I have to say. Yeah. Right? Now, experts expect this technology to revolutionize many industries by replacing humans in services and creative jobs. And for example, well, my job. Earlier, I asked ChatGPT what I should talk about in this segment, and it gave me seven categories. And I won't have time to go through them all, so I'll pick two of them. Here we go. One of the categories is connectivity and communication. So let's talk about smartphones. After so many years of development, you'd think that today's phone makers would be hard to roll out fresh innovations. But that's what Huawei did this year. Its Mate 60 Pro model is the world's first flagship smartphone with satellite calling feature, meaning it can use a satellite orbiting the Earth to make calls in areas without normal mobile signal. Outdoor lovers who travel to mountains and forests are going to love this feature. Now, moving from hardware to software now, well, Huawei has been building its own operating system called Harmony with the goal of doing away with Google's Android operating system. Now, this year, it is moving closer to this objective as hundreds of technical experts from many of China's biggest companies gathered in Beijing last month to receive training to be certified as Harmony OS developers. Now, Huawei already says more than 700 million devices were equipped with Harmony OS as of August this year. Now, the next category, as suggested by ChatGPT, is sustainable tech. So let's narrow it down a bit and talk about electric vehicles. Perhaps few EV car models in recent years can attract as many eyeballs as the Tesla Cybertruck, which held its delivery event this November. I mean, look at it. Lily, you've been to many auto shows, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think about the look of this it? This one. The, yeah. Wow, it looks very futuristic. Yes, yeah. it feels like something straight out of a vintage 1990s video game about the future. Right, yeah. Right? It's the uh, stainless steel ulterior. It's surely, surely very cool. I'm sure uh, Elon Musk, who is the CEO of the company, knows how to create shock value at least. Now, too bad it is currently only available in North America. But the most eye-catching development in China's auto industry is the spectacular rise of its own electric vehicle sector. In just the past week, Huawei unveiled a premium EV model named M9 on the left, while Chinese smartphone maker Xiaomi announced its entry into the EV market with the introduction of the SU7 on the right. Now, notably, both Huawei and Xiaomi have transitioned from you know, selling phones, equipment, and electronics to now also offering cars, exemplifying the immense popularity of the industry within China. The country now accounts of 64% of global uh, production and 59% of global EV sales in 2022. Now, China's BYD overtook Tesla to become the world's biggest EV manufacturer in 2022, but 
the one category that is still trailed behind was the sales of fully electric vehicles. Now, uh, we'll likely, this will likely change by the end of this year, as BYD sold just 3,000 fewer electric vehicles than Tesla in the third quarter. Analysts say it's highly likely to overtake Tesla by the end of this year in this category as well. And these are the latest in tech. And with that, it's back to you, Lily. Great stuff. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Chen Xi, for those insights. And now for more discussions on the smart economy and related trends, let's bring in Ms. Xiao Yu Xiong, a research fellow at the University of Exeter. Ms. Xiong, uh, how might the trend of countries you know, striving to develop their own smart economies be changing the global economic landscape? Okay, uh, thank you for having me. I think the global shift towards building smart economies um, is positioned to reshape the economic landscape significantly. Uh, you know, as countries increasingly invest in digital infrastructure and emerging technology, we are seeing a shift in the way business uh, operates and the nations compete. Um, automation and the data-driven decision-making are becoming key drivers of economic, economic growth. For example, this enables business to streamline processes, uh, reduce costs, and uh, force innovation. And this trend not only um, increase the competitiveness of individual countries, but also can reshape the dynamics of the global economy. And the emergence of smart economy also creates um, new opportunities for international collaboration. And as countries um, uh, share a, a technology advancement and the best practice, we can expect to see cross-border collaboration that exceed uh, traditional uh, economic boundaries. However, it is also very essential to acknowledge challenges. Uh, for example, addressing potential job displacement mm -hmm. and ensure inclusivity when adopting these smart technologies. We need to strike balance between technology advancement and societal well-being. So in essence, uh, the transition towards uh, building smart economy um, it represents a defining moment mm -hmm. in the global ec economic landscape. Yes, Ms. Um, Ms. Shun, so I would like I, to uh, follow up on what you talked about, the, uh, the changes brought about by technology transformations uh, to the labor market, to the job market. What do you think are the primary challenges that are associated with this transformation? All right, you know, I think so. We know, uh, we know the automation and the artificial intelligence and the digitalizing can optimize the workflows they are increasing efficiencies and also creating new job opportunities. However, we also face various challenges. The first one would be the concern of job displacement, in particular in traditional industries where routine and repetitive tasks are being automated. So we need um, upscaling and uh, transcaling skills to help workers to adapt to the evolving job requirement. And, and there is also another risk of um, widening inequality you know that everyone have equal access to the benefits of technology um, advancement. So this creates a digital divide. We, we need to take efforts and to ensure the inclusive access to training and education in tech-related skills. I think finally um, would be the ethical considerations, um, issues like data privacy and algorithm bias and the whole automation can affect societal. Um, this is a very important to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, Ms. Xion, uh, the big question is, what could be the next game changer in science and te technology? I mean, we're talking about that on the backdrop of uh, the ongoing technological transformation changing the global economy. Well, um, firstly, I would say um, the quantum computing is emerging as a potential game changer in mm -hmm. science technology. So unlike regular computers that use bits, quantum computing uses things called quantum bits. And this can enable parallel processing at unprecedented speeds and can potentially transform various sectors, such as encryption and optimization and even the speeding up the new discovery of new drugs. So um, another... Uh, yes, Mr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think uh, another game changer would consider artificial intelligence. Okay. So as algorithm becomes more sophisticated and the data become abundant, I think AI has the power to in, uh, improve the decision making process across industries. For example, it can optimize uh, supply chains 
and you can, can personalize uh, health care and also even um, automated routine tasks. Okay. Yeah, I think the last one we consider about the clean energy technologies uh, mm -hmm. also has great potential, like breakthroughs in renewable energy sources and uh, energy storage not only address environmental challenges, but also mm -hmm. create new economic um, opportunities. Okay. So I would see quantum computing, AI, and uh, clean energy storage would be the next game changers in science technology. Oh, great insights. Thank you so much. That's Ms. Xiao Yusheng, Research Fellow at the University of Exeter. Now, as we conclude this special year-end edition of Global Business, we anticipate that 2024 will be a crucial year for adjusting China's economy, requiring substantial efforts in stabilizing and sustaining growth. And here on Global Business, as usual, we will continue to provide the latest updates on economic, business and financial news from China and across the globe. Now, before I sign off today's program, we will be sharing with you the New Year, New year expectations of some uh, Beijing citizens. This is Lily Liu in Beijing, signing off for now. Goodbye. Solidifying. Heartbreaking. Varied. Xiwang. Diverse. Very memorable. Beginning. Discovery. Better sleep. Hi everyone, we've had a great year coming back to China. And we've had so many adventures so far, and who knows where we'll go in 2024. What the year meant for the people around us here in Beijing. I think that everyone was sort of getting back to work, China mm -hmm. reopening. You got to go around and visit companies and industries and go visit a lot of people who haven't been in China for a long time. 2023年,我觉得最大的成就就是我们成功地举办了 Society is getting back on track with social mm -hmm. events. Hopefully, uh, work progress and international relations will continue as well. Maybe an, a romantic relationship. I hope that our members will be more and more and a lot of traveling. I want to pass the exam to become a real uh, lawyer. Make more money! <laughs> <laughs> and that's all for the year, guys. See you in 2024. Happy New Year! Happy New Year!